Hello, everybody, and, um, and welcome. I think um, the title says it all, really. Young, educated, and out of work. We know that the Middle East has the highest youth jobless rate in the world, um, and that this is a major social and, uh, and political challenge. And I think when we compare that to the image that I'm sure many of us have in our minds of those, you know, of two years ago when young people on the streets in Egypt and Tunisia were absolutely at the forefront of giving us enormous hope for the region, um, that uh, what we would really like to do is to see the image closer to that and the outcome closer to that and those aspirations than, unfortunately, some of the really difficult challenges that, are, that we face in the region today. Um, I hope this conversation is going to take us a few steps closer to that. Um, before we start, can I get a sense of how many of you here in the room are involved in youth issues, in education and employment, that kind of sector? Okay, great. How many of you are working or investing uh, or, uh, or if your organization is engaged in the Middle East? Great, fantastic. That's good. Um, so yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna get some results here, I think. Um, our panel brings together people who are all involved in trying to establish better opportunities for youth in the Arab world. I'd like to suggest we listen to them first for 40 minutes or so, um, and then we'll open the floor and we you know, have a real skull, solutions-oriented, ideas-generating conversation. Um, we know that there's as much expertise there as there is, as there is here. To our panel, Fadi Gandour, I think many of you would know, founded the logistics company Aramex 30 years ago. He's one of the Arab world's most successful and respected business leaders. These days he's chair also of WAMDA, uh, a support and investment platform for new entrepreneurs in the Middle East. Osama Hassanein, where to start, entrepreneur, venture capitalist, educator, you sit on numerous boards. Um, today you're here really as chairman of TechWadi, yeah? a non-profit platform for collaboration between Silicon Valley and the Arab world. And who here knows about Tekwadi and Wamda already? Okay, good. Riham Dibas, you're on your way to becoming an Osama Hassanein or Fadi Gandor. Maybe. <laughs> Riham is a Palestinian entrepreneur uh, from Ramallah. She's in the process of establishing her own web-based business at Sakan. And uh, you're only, the only woman on the, among, among our uh, panelists, so uh, we'll be keen to hear your thoughts on the gender perspective that, that you've, uh, as you see it. You're also a graduate of Education for Employment, EFE, which takes me to Jamie, who's the CEO um, and, uh, and president of Education for Employment, EFE. And your mission through EFE is to create opportunities for young people in the Arab world by training them for the workforce. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, Jawad Nabulsi couldn't join us for rather complicated visa reasons. Um, it's a shame. He's not here. He was at the forefront of the Tahrir Square uh, protest movement in Egypt. He works with some of the, uh, one of the, in one of the biggest slums in Cairo. Um, we did have a chat to him yesterday, though, and I think we've, we'll try to channel some of his ideas into the conversation. Um, so to get us started, Jamie, um, perhaps you could, could begin by framing a little the challenge that, that the region faces. And I actually want to start by saying that um, this, is, this is actually truly a global crisis and a global problem now, youth unemployment. Um, you know, the, the trends now as we're coming out of the global recession are that economies are actually getting slowly back on their feet. Um, but unfortunately, youth unemployment rates are going up at the same time. So this is becoming a global crisis. But in the Middle East and North Africa, many of the things that are contributing to this crisis are really accentuated. And that's what we're here to talk about. And, and one of the reasons our organization was founded to try to work to provide at least one um, hard, concrete solution to one aspect of the problem. And you know, at a very basic level, there are two aspects to the challenge of youth employment. One is you've got to have economies that are creating jobs. You have to have entrepreneurial ecosystems that are providing supports and opportunities for young entrepreneurs to build companies and help them grow and accelerate them. But you also have this challenge that education for employment is, is trying to address, which is a gap, a market gap between the education systems that are not producing young people with the learning and skills and competencies that they need to get jobs in the private sector and this so-called skills mismatch. And that's what, as our name implies, education for employment is all about. There are a couple of other trends that are really troubling in the Middle East. Um, uh, you've got um, this effect now, and it, it's not only in the Middle East and North Africa, but it's really accentuated there, where young people with 
higher degrees who are graduating from college can actually be um, twice um, as unlikely to get unemployed. I think the rate in Tunisia is something like 41% of Tunisian college graduates are unemployed versus 26%. Jordan has the same um, phenomenon, Egypt the same. So basically a social contract has been broken. Families and young people who have invested in education thought that a degree in engineering, law, uh, medicine would lead to greater economic opportunity are not seeing that realized. And that, that is uh, a cause of great frustration and it's a, it, it can lead to a lot of desperation and, and lack of hope. Certainly one of the things that all of us are trying to address. Um, there's also obviously the effect of uh, young women having a much harder time getting a job or, or getting supported to start up a new venture. So you've got even in a country like Turkey that's actually quite remarkable and in many of its um, uh, statistics three times uh, less likely for a young woman to be employed than a man. Um, so you've got a gender um, gap also in employment that a lot of us are also trying to, to address. So there, there's a mix of, of um, factors that um, are not unique, but they're accentuated in the Middle East and North Africa that contribute to this. One quarter of all young people in the Middle East and North Africa are out of work um, and trying to get connected to an economic opportunity um, or to a first job. And so a lot of what I hope the conversation is going to be about today, and we'd love to engage the audience, is how do we move from recognizing this problem, this crisis, to really proactively identifying the solutions that need to be scaled up, the new innovations that need to be brought to the region, the new partnerships that need to be created to accelerate change. And um, this is kind of a mantra that I use when I'm talking about the issue um, even outside the Middle East and North Africa, is that we've got to move beyond problem identification. We know the problem now. But we actually also know a lot of the solutions that have worked in the Middle East, but also in other contexts that we can begin to think about how to adapt and, um, and bring to, in our case, the region we care about, but um, in other countries that are also facing similar challenges. Great. So, um, thank you. So I'm just continuing from where Jamie uh, has put it and maybe widen the scope a little bit. and. Uh, uh, maybe state the challenge uh, a little bit uh, uh, on, on, on the wider scale. So, um, Bersin Mastella and, and their local partner in the Middle East publish every year uh, something called the, youth, the Arab Youth uh, Survey. They just published it about two or three days ago. Just a couple of points that you, you, we need to all keep in mind about what has consistently been on top of the mind of Arab youth, <coughs> consistently. Um, other than talking about aspirations, which is everybody's issue anywhere in the world. So they say it's fair pay, home ownership, and the rising cost of living. They're in the top five issues other than feeling good stuff on the top five issues. But there is also one thing that is very interesting. 74% of Arab youth today, uh, today say that the future is ahead of them. There's a sense of optimism. So as much as we say high cost, uh, 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 unemployment, all sorts of issues that are popping up, they're also saying we're also optimistic. There is a sense of an empowerment in it. Um, so as I am trying to frame this, I'd like to quote uh, probably the most important document that has come out on the Arab Spring, if you want. And it's a document that just uh, was published recently uh, by uh, two economists, Adil Malik and uh, Basim Awdallah, called the economics of the Arab Spring. And for Odol, I've, I've noticed that most of you are interested or are practicing in the Arab world the issue. You need to read it. I'll give you the details of that paper. It's quite an extensive paper. He, they say in it, and I want to, if you don't mind, quote a couple of quotations out of it because it gives us the framework. It's, there are two. Uh, it's a, it is a revolution of aspirations, even as aspirations have become more mobile with the new gadgets of globalization, the local systems of governance remain ossified, offering limited economic mobility to the region's youth, even physical mobility, physical mobility, and that's very critical, which means open markets. There is no, by the way, we talk about the Middle East, the Middle East is 21, 22 countries, totally fragmented. Our markets are not open to each other. We can trade in free trade agreements with the United States of America. We can do free trade agreements with uh, Singapore. But we certainly shy away from free trade agreements across the border with, between Jordan, Saudi Arabia, or, or, uh, or Palestine is another story altogether, obviously. They can't even trade within their own cities. 
even physical mobility across borders is restricted. Unlike Western Europe, where class-based struggles have historically driven political change, the Middle East is witnessing a truly generational, truly generational struggle for inclusion, inclusion of the youth, because we are ruled by uh, people that are at least, I mean, I am in my 50s and I'm already old. So imagine that the generation that is already ruling in the Arab world and what is happening, in, and, and the Arab Spring is about that. Another quotation that I would like to continue from that paper is, it says, recent events in the region provide an apt reminder that the prevailing development model has reached its expiry date. And we need to recognize that. It has expired. It doesn't work anymore. anymore. What does that mean? It means government-led development has failed. And the minute we recognize that, then we are going to be addressing the issue. The minute government stops monopolizing the development process, then maybe we can start finding solutions to the youth unemployment issue. So, and then the model, this model, they say, is built on oil and aid fortunes. Oil and aid fortunes. So the countries that have oil have their own challenges. And the countries that don't, don't have oil are oil countries that are dependent on aid from oil countries. So if Jordan is a neighbor of Saudi Arabia and we, re we don't have oil, then we certainly have a share of the Saudi oil. And then thus the same prevailing problem is uh, actually shared across uh, both, uh, both uh, those uh, geographies. This model built on oil and, and aid fortunes and a Leviathan state is fast becoming a liability, obviously. While politically expedient, this development model is fast becoming unsustainable. Apart from the questions about its fiscal sustainability, this development model has also bred colossal failure of expectations, obviously. Apart from questions about development uh, uh, expectations, in resource-rich countries, critical issue that I'd like to address here, in resource-rich countries, labor market entrants, labor market entrants have an ingrained preference for the, for the obvious, for well-paid public sector jobs. It's their preference. Government pays for your education and is going to employ you whether you're good, whether you are capable, whether you are not you are going to have a job, and then we are going to worry about you being jobless or incapable of actually being employed in the private sector or in any skill-based productive job. The result is high levels of voluntary, they say, unemployment, but leaves the private sector with a shortage of skills. So we end up employing people from, uh, from expatriates. So you tell me, why is the Saudization issue a big issue? because we have an issue of employability of the Saudi, or an employability of the Gulf, or the employability of Jordan, uh, Jordanian nationals, so that I don't put this as an issue in, 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 in the Gulf only. In Jordan, 20% of our labor is expatriate, even though we are a country of non-oil and we have a massive amount of graduates. So it's not a Gulf issue alone, so that we are, uh, so it's a question of employability and the skills we will. Then, these labor markets, they say, contradictions mean that often young people are not only unemployed, they are also unemployable. This clearly is a fa failing both of the education system that we're going to address and the economic structure that we live in. I think this frames the challenge that we have very clearly, and uh, I hope we will come up with some uh, more positive, I mean, this is this likes. This, we we're all depressed now suddenly. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, but, uh, <laughs> but we needed to frame it. We needed to frame it so that we can address it as it is. Yeah. Thank you, Fadi. Osama. Well, I will start by saying I'm in my 60s, so perhaps completely irrelevant when it comes to management. But uh, I have to say that while many of us have called the first three years of this decade the Arab Spring, I see it really as the beginning of the decade of entrepreneurship. Uh, in the Middle East. And I can actually, to some extent, maybe share with you uh, proofs that will say uh, that the best is yet to come. First of all, in terms of uh, the global statistic, uh, like Fadi has said, you read, we need 100 million uh, you know, new <laughs> employments to be created in the next 10 years. I mean, the US can barely manage to create 1.2 million a year. So these numbers are really, uh, I guess it uh, reminds me again that uh, sometimes 
there are lies, then lies and statistics. I mean, there are some things that we cannot really believe in. I 100% agree with uh, everything that Freddie has said about the incompetence um, of uh, what we have in government, and therefore, it is going to be the public sector, the private sector, that is going to lead this initiative. And what are we doing, and where are we today? To start with, the supply of entrepreneurs is at an absolutely all-time high, and it can only double and triple in the next three years. In the MIT Arab Business Plan competition, 1,800 three years ago, 4,800 this year. That's number of companies times, you know, three to eight per, uh, per company. And you've got a very nice number of 30,000 to start to work with. Around these, employ uh, the, these uh, entrepreneurs, because that's not enough to have people who are desirous, but is there a hope for them? And my claim is that yes, there is. And let's just imagine a Pentagon around these uh, uh, entrepreneurs. In the last three years, the number of very effective incubators that have been created, whether it is you know, Tahrir Square and uh, uh, Flat Six Lab in Egypt, uh, Beritac and uh, Sequence, and most importantly, Oasis 500 in uh, Jordan, 700 companies have gone through training, 54 companies have been financed, up from how much? Absolutely zero in 2010. So incubation. Number two, angel financing. I remember uh, teaching at AUC in 2010, and honest to God, guys, for 10 minutes, people could not understand what angel financing is. They thought someone must have wings. And I have to say that, you know, one of us actually, uh, you know, friend and family, or as I say today, friend, family, and fools that actually invest in startup companies. Um, there are at least 200 mentors and angel investors up from zero. And the number of companies that they have financed that have produced results is quite impressive. One of them, as an example, and maybe this is an extreme, uh, Hamra Wadallah, who came to Stanford, his father wanted him to get a PhD. And he said, but I want to start a company. He said, okay, you start a company after the PhD. He did. The company just received $65 million in financing at a market value of $750 million. The company's name is Cloudera. These examples did not exist uh, three years ago. Now, of course, on the other side, you know, uh, Perihana Bouzid, who was the winner of the MIT Arab Business Plan competition, okay, up and running, 54 employees, self-financing, and fantastic. So mentors and uh, angel investors are providing an incredible engine of, uh, uh, of growth, and they are smart people who are dedicated heart and mind and money to create a better future. Number three is the business acceleration. I personally see three companies, roughly a day, of people coming in from the Middle East uh, to come in and kind of uh, integrate into the community in uh, Silicon Valley. And you know what? They enter into competition at expos and demos, whether it is you know, plug and play or, uh, or uh, launch uh, festival. And three percent, no, sorry, three out of 30 companies in the competition are Arab countries, uh, are Arab uh, companies. It was zero. Now, this is very small, but it is at the same time something extremely uh, encouraging. Number four is the corporate involvement, whether it is you know, Microsoft or Google or Oracom Telecom or Omnia or uh, Saudi Telecom. Everyone is trying to find a way whereby they can participate in the, uh, if you will, transformation of innovation into value system, value, number of employees, and what have you. Uh, and they are not the only ones. And then last but not least is venture capital. It's small. We all know that in the Middle East, venture capital is worth 2.12 billion a year, of which 2 billion is in Israel. 120 million is in uh, 300 uh, and, you know, uh, million people. But that 120 million is up from 18 million the year before. So uh, I am personally full of hope. I have to tell you, I go to villages that have no water system where life expectancy is 33 at birth. And uh, to maybe make one final comment that I actually shared with you that would support uh, both of you. I was talking to the Minister of Education in uh, Egypt, not the current one, and said we have 2 million children born every year. And at entry level in elementary school, there is space for 1.2 million. So 800,000 be left out. How are you going to bridge that gap? He said, Dr. Osama, don't worry about it. They will not all make it because of infant mortality. I thought you were optimistic. <laughs> but I, I, I believe when what uh, Isaac Newton said, I mean, I can describe the movement of the star, but not the madness of man. It is incompetence of the government. Thank you. Thank you.
Reham, what's been your experience in the West Bank recently and what sort of future do you feel there is for you and your friends and colleagues? Okay, I'm going to start from the right beginning, telling my own story. There you find a girl who was really, who got really high grades at school and I was, everybody was telling me the future is going to be like sky is the limit, you're going to be somebody that's <coughs> famous and that's going to be doing great stuff in the future. And I got high grades, which was a curse for me because I entered into a major that I was stuck in for five years and I actually didn't find myself there. And the, kind of the majors that are offered by universities in Palestine are quite limited. I graduated and I thought, okay, so university passed and I think I'm going to find me an opportunity soon. Everybody was telling me that education is much different than the job and the, 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 the training you're going to be receiving when you go to the workplace. And the thing I found is that it was quite more difficult than I w I've been told. And for two months, I got into an internship that my boss wasn't ready to pay, for, to pay me a salary or anything. And I was too shy because I was, I was a girl to ask for a raise or ask for when is the salary coming. And then I moved to something else. I worked at a startup. I, I then interned with um, Employment for Education for the AFE. And I, I, I was startled by the facts that they taught me that I wasn't actually ready for the workplace because I didn't know how to write a CV. I didn't know how to dress well for an interview. And a lot of basic skills that we graduate from universities and that we are lacking. Uh, but seeing my journey from last year until this moment, I think we made a lot of progress. And I'm looking at the, at the scene right now in Palestine. I'm looking where, where it used to be and where it got to be right now. I'm seeing this community to community programs that are being organized, addressing the youth um, to just qualify them for the essential skills that they should be getting before heading to the workplace and just being bold enough to ask for their rights and know what actually their rights are in the workplace. And you have these programs for entrepreneurs. I remember two years ago, my, my friend, she was an entrepreneur and she was starting her own startup and everybody was thinking she's crazy. Everybody, a lot of us, including me, I didn't know what a startup mean. I didn't know what a VC mean. I didn't know what entrepreneurship mean. And now that I have all these combined in my mind, I'm going to actually be starting a new venture soon, uh, which is going to be um, an awesome opportunity for me to just realize myself and my capabilities again after I lost my, my, my belief in myself for two years after graduation, just searching for the right place here and there. And now I'm looking at the scene right there in Palestine, and there are these amazing stuff that's happening. Um, we have this uh, accelerator for entrepreneurs that's going to be starting really soon, and I'm, I'm lucky enough to be part of it. I had no idea how I got there, but I actually did. And it's amazing when you sit in a room surrounded by all these people that next to you, there's a VC who's ready to talk to you and just give you his advice. And here, there's an entrepreneur who failed three or four times who's just ready to, ask, to answer any question that you have. And you have this rising entrepreneurial community at Palestine, um, a room full of 20 persons, maybe, that are gathering each month to just talk about things. And it's amazing when you look at these persons and how humble they are to just talk to you. Like meeting Fadi here is something great. I never thought that I'm going to be reaching to just meeting him in person. But we met before. Yeah, we met in, in the startup I was just telling you that I worked for when I graduated. Um, I do believe that the future is going to be so promising. I do believe that Palestine will be having many success stories that are going to be coming out, whether it's this accelerator or the, the different programs like EFE, the Organizing for People. Um, and I'm currently actually, even before the accelerator in a program for entrepreneurs, I might be getting a fund soon, which was a dream for me, like a couple of months ago. And um, I do believe that the young are they are educated, they are capable of doing a lot of stuff, but they just need the right guidance. And I didn't have that a couple of years ago. I do now. And um, I, I really want to be part of this process that gets other entrepreneurs and other youth who graduate and not know where to go 
to just up on their feet and realize their own skills, whether it was in a job that they actually like or just starting a new venture that it's bold and it's a, it's a, it's a bold um, decision to make and it's a crazy for many people, but it's a great opportunity even for creating new opportunities for other young in the Middle East. And I'm really optimistic where the future will be for everybody and I'm sure everybody is going to be looking at Palestine within the next one or two years and see amazing stuff happening there. And hopefully, I'm going to be I'm going to be part of this. Thank so you, Brian. Thank you. Good news out of the West Bank. We love that. We're going to move on to talk about solutions and opportunities, but I'd like to drill down a little bit more into perhaps some of the reasons why these. Uh, unemployment and underemployment and low par uh, participation in the workforce, why this all exists. Can we unpick that a little bit? Cu is it cultural pressures? You've talked about the education system, perhaps elaborate a little bit more on how ossified and why that's not working. Um, and for women particularly, why participation in the workforce is, is often a, a challenge and difficult. Would one of you, uh, Riham or Jamie, or like to start on perhaps on the challenges that face women in particular okay, uh, so in working? In working, the working place, there are a lot of challenges, but the, the, the good thing is that they are fading away um, step by step. Maybe you have a long run to, to go, but they are fading away. Like it's now, it's, there's no question about being a woman and actually being employed because families can tell that a guy and a girl, many families that I, 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 I know and from where I come from, they just like taking for granted that a girl should be educated and should get a job. And she's free to just live away from home, just realizing herself, which is really good thing that didn't exist in the past. And you have these um, girls that I'm seeing right now that I never, including myself, I never imagined that I'm going to be sitting in a room full of men uh, just discussing things because I thought I didn't have the, the enough confidence, enough skills. I thought I had less, less IQ than them. But now, moving two years ahead and just seeing the, th the, the scene right now, I'm seeing even girls and not only graduates, but, uh, but uh, as well, uh, there are these girls that haven't graduated yet. They are two or three years for, away from graduation and they still come to events and they, they come to um, different gatherings of people. They just want to, to know where to go. They just want to have their look for their own guidance. And it's, it's not forbidden anymore for a woman to, to just go to these gatherings because that families are realizing that women are just a great investment for the future, especially mm. Palestinian women. And Great. Jamie, yeah. uh, is there a broader observation you can make about the region? You work in many countries. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, look, I, I agree with, with Fadi that um, the, the system is broken. The government-led, government-driven system is broken in the region. And I also agree that the real change is happening now and will continue to happen if it's really private sector driven with government enabling and supporting. And I think one of the big problems in, in our work is that these systems have never traditionally talked to each other. So you do not have universities or schools talking to industry talking to sectors that are growing to understand what the skill needs are to try to figure out how they can reform their curricula, bring in new um, courses and that sort of thing. So again, this is why we actually were formed to bridge that gap and try to translate from school to work. And you, you and I, I'd like to bar, I love that, that lean in phrase that everybody's talking about. I mean, you need people to lean in. You need businesses to lean in and say, we're going to take a chance on a young person we're going to, um, if you can get them job ready, we're going to train them on the job. You need educational leaders to lean in and say, we're not going to just be accountable for graduating young people anymore. We're going to actually track where they go. And we're going to be accountable for how many of them are employed six months out, a year out. And if that accountability changes and that mindset changes in the educational institutions, I think you'll, you'll begin to see these gaps shrinking. And then you, I think, need more. I mean, we're still at a, at a point where we're, scaling incrementally. You know, we're scaling with larger businesses, um, with obviously a much more diverse um, set of business partnerships, but you need to start seeing coalitions of businesses, for example, in key sectors like hospitality, tourism, construction, banking, coming together, defining core skill sets, committing to a, a certain number of jobs so that providers like us, educational institutions, can make the investments to recruit 
train and place um, motivated young people. And you know, I, I share a lot of the optimism that Riem and, and uh, Osama um, uh, have, have indicated, but it's going to take a huge amount of effort and resources and intentional effort to push the needle in a very different direction than it's been. And time. And, and, presumably. and time. Yeah. Presumably. But, you know, we need to remember this is a generational issue. So there are no magic wands here, nor, nor are there any solutions that are going to be uh, to, to come out from a hat and then suddenly everything is resolved. It doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. So the issue of workforce readiness, uh, uh, the matching between the requirements of the job market and, uh, require, or, or, and the education system is unfortunately, as we keep talking about it, and this is not an issue post-Arab Spring, by the way, or during the Arab Spring. This, I've been on panels talking about the same story uh, and Walid Banawi is here and he's laughing because he knows we've been talking about it for, for over a decade at least. The mismatch story is serious, is real, it's global by the way. It's not only in, in the Arab world. The US has a big issue about what are we teaching our kids and how do we, how, what is the job market uh, requirements. The bigger problem in the Arab world is that the public sector had become such uh, an intoxicating attractor uh, that uh, every kid wants to study and, and go to the public sector because the public sector told him, you are guaranteed a job regardless of what we teach you. And that's a, a friend of mine in the Gulf told me once, this is our biggest guilt feeling here. We have uh, basically made um, a contract with our youth. We said, we will give you a lousy education, but in return, we're going to employ you. Uh, and then, uh, so, so it's, it's the, the 21st, century skills need to be addressed. So when we, take, uh, when we talk education reform, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we need to recognize that our education system is not only broken, we know that, but we need to, we need to bypass it. For those of us, uh, the biggest challenge is how do we marginalize our ministries of education because they are not going to be responsive at all. And we need to think out of the box and think 24th, 21st century education, which means online. Bypass them. Tell them the train is leaving. Stop the, or establish universities and institutions that cater for the 21st century skills needed that are parallel to the system. The system is dead. It's a beaten, it's a dead horse. It is not worth it. That's my view. The public sector is so slow, you cannot move it. So it's, it's the question of, of, of matching. Mm. Uh, I'll give a couple of examples. There's a university in Jordan that, that is an IT university. They have 400, they teach technology skills, degrees. 400 graduates a year. All get four jobs uh, uh, when, when, they, when they graduate. All. 100% employment. Why? Very simple question. They are teaching skills that are needed. You go across the Gulf, you go to all tech companies across the Gulf, in the back office of these tech companies are Jordanians. They have addressed that. And that was a strategic decision that was taken when King Abdullah came in into, uh, he partnered with the private sector, partnered with the private sector and said, you lead it. And then 10 years later, half a generation later, you have a booming IT sector in Jordan. Mm -hmm. The biggest number of startups in technology in the Arab world today happens in Jordan. Why? It's not an accident. We need to learn from that story. I'll give you another story in the, in the hospitality business. The hospitality business, once peace happened a little, for, for a certain period of time between Jordan and Israel and, and all, everybody was lovey-dovey and Yasser Arafat was hugging everyone, <laughs> we, uh, we effectively had a boom, a boom in the, uh, in the tourism industry. Hotels were popping up all over the place. And what happened? We used to say that Jordanians don't work in, uh, in the service industry. We don't want to be waiters. Go to Jordan today and you will find that everyone, every waiter is practically a Jordanian. What happened? It used to be called a cultural issue. You know, Jordanians don't like to serve, really. Uh, you pay them well, you train them well, they're gonna be in that job market. So they, let's, let's take what works. Let's take what works and say we wanna do more of it. It's about skills, it's not about ed education. Yeah, yeah. If we obliterate the word education and say skills, 
then we are basically being realistic about it and making it a practical issue rather than a philosophical issue. It's not philosophical. You've talked about the need for the private sector to really take a much, uh, a much stronger driving seat in all of this. But government is there. Government controls so much of the space. To what extent are you seeing shifts in particular countries that might be offering opportunities? Who's, who's sort of moving in the right direction, who isn't? Can Osama or, or Fadi perhaps paint a bit of a picture for us there? I'll paint a picture maybe of the one that I know the most, uh, and that's uh, Egypt, and then I'll use the exact opposite example. Uh, the government has actually, uh, to some extent, partnered with us to create uh, an incubator. Uh, that was in 2010, and in 2011 it was launched, a plug-and-play incubator, which since then has been closed. And that has created a problem for 300 entrepreneurs who are supposed to be housed within. As far as the government is concerned, they actually don't feel what you feel. Uh, it's, uh, it's a question of security, it's a question of convenience, it's a question of uh, resources, if you will. It's not a question of value creation, employment creation, security. And, uh, and, uh, and hope. So what do you do then? Uh, you, uh, in, uh, in our case, we actually uh, went to uh, Enterprise Qatar, and actually Nora Manai is here, to create exactly the same project. And that project is very, very focused with metrics. Uh, and it is about the ability uh, to uh, mentor about 6,000 companies in the next five years and if you do the math about the number of jobs that are going to be created, uh, then you suddenly scale up to something that is very, very impressive. Let's say about uh, 30,000 or so. There are governments with whom you cannot work. Uh, and then there are people in government with whom you can actually achieve uh, miracles, quite frankly. Uh, Nora, you want to say maybe something about the program? Yes, actually, I would love to talk about uh, the program, especially with the production of Fadi made uh, about uh, the situation in, in the Arab countries, especially in the Gulf, and the challenge that uh, have faced us uh, when we wanted to design the program that was catered towards Qataris, to support Qatari start business. My first challenge was how I can really attract Qataris. You know, we have the highest per capita in the world, and they are very re relaxed and reluctant to really start a business. So, and there is a huge opportunity in the meantime. So there's something wrong in the equation. So, um, you know, it's, I thought about, you know, designing something that will make, you know, uh, uh, make it easier for us to attract them. So instead of earning X, you can earn 10 X. So we have to really simplify it and design it. So um, and uh, um, and also uh, we thought of the of the vision that the leaders in Qatar have really uh, draw and they they really care about employment in the region and there were some initiatives that are created in Qatar uh, Salatek is one of them and we went to them and I told them listen let's work together to design something that will bring hope for the region through Qatar where you know in in, in my case the entrepreneurs or the, the the youth in Qatar will learn will work with their peers and they will have an, uh, you know a hope they will support in you know giving this hope in the region so the funding um, or we looked into the the the, the whole uh, ecosystem so building a mini ecosystem in Qatar uh, reducing the gaps or, or fulfilling the gaps that does exist today. So uh, people with cash in the private sector, they are here in Qatar and also in the region. Um, uh, ideas are really great ideas. I was surprised to see also what I have seen with through MIT and others. Um, uh, so the, the problem is again with the government. So how we can convince the government to bring us a mini platform in Qatar. So this is what uh, myself and Osama and the team in Enterprise Qatar is working on, putting together a mini ecosystem that would succeed, succeed and then it can be replicated. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, also attracting youth from the region to use this ecosystem. So uh, through this program, we are going to give um, really good funding, especially to graduates from other programs like OSS 500 or Flexus Lab. So those who have really built something that can be accelerated and access to business, ac access to private sector, uh, access to also um, um, uh, reducing uh, or taking them to Silicon Valley and to also three to six mon uh, months uh, uh, internship so we designed something, hopefully uh, we're going to launch it uh, uh, on the 25th, and hopefully we're going to see something happening in the coming year, inshallah. Mm -hmm. I think that the partnership between 
uh, Osama Fayyad and uh, King Abdullah to create Oasis 500 is an absolutely perfect example of a truly, truly extraordinary <coughs> private-public partnership that has produced results. I was wondering whether we now tap into some of the expertise in the room, and I think... Let me add, just, yeah. just so that I, I, I'm a bit more positive than I was earlier. So, <laughs> so there is a solution, okay? So, no, I think, I think one issue that we didn't talk much about, even though we touched around it, is, is the role of the private sector. And, and as, as much as we bash the public sector, uh, I must also say that the, pri the private sector has, uh, has, has a big part of the solution, but hasn't been doing as much as, as it should be. It hasn't felt that it was part of the, of the development process. It hasn't. I mean, there are some of us that do, and there are a lot of us that don't. They, 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 the old concept of that we are going to focus on our own businesses and our own profitability, again, is a broken uh, is a broken model. Uh, it's a broken uh, capitalism in its traditional, uh, in, its, in its historical, uh, if you want, proposition is no longer working on a global basis and specifically in the Arab world because the Arab youth would not have erupted the way they erupted against the private sector also. So they didn't erupt against old systems, they uh, against old regimes. They erupted against everyone that was part and parcel of that old regime, including including the private sector. And a lot of people uh, that were in the private sector in various countries, that uh, specifically Saudi Arabia, uh, specifically Egypt, where uh, some of our good friends who had never even been part of the corruption system suddenly get labeled and uh, the wide brush of everything that is in the private domain or private enterprise is being questioned as a whole. So uh, there is a group of us that have come out with something that is called, and I'm going to put it out there, that's, that's called the corporate entrepreneurship responsibility. Corporate entrepreneurship responsibility is taking CSR from the uh, marketing uh, departments where it is only feel good, nice things that the private sector are doing on the surface and on the margins, taking it to the core of what the private sector does. We are entrepreneurs. And then if we're thinking of the challenges of development, then let's think of them from an entrepreneurial perspective because we know what that means. So there are 10 issues that I, I'm proposing here very quickly. It's issues of how we deal with education and entrepreneurial education because entrepreneurial skills, just like uh, uh, Suraya Sauti will tell us, is a skill that needs to build from the very early days of students so that they accept the concept of private enterprise in general and think that it's a respectable thing to move into. I mean, it's a, it's a mentality story. So you give it to kids, they go out and say, we're either entrepreneurs or it's okay to work in the private sector. It's not bad to be in the private sector. That's very essential. And there are many models out there, and Soraya is partnering in that program. We're also talking about access to capital. The private sector is very rich, is very capable has deep pockets. Today, entrepreneurial programs in the Arab world are initiated by the public sector. Why? They have no idea what it means to be an entrepreneur. It's the private sector that needs to start investing in startups, doing for the Oasis 500, working with, uh, with Qatar uh, Foundation and working with various institutions uh, in various uh, uh, semi or semi government or, or public-private uh, partnerships. We're talking about internships. The private sector in the Arab world doesn't know what the concept of internship is. But it is so easy to open up your jobs in the summer. It doesn't cost, cost much. We're putting up platforms. These are things that are already happening. These are not theoretical. Mentorships. We talk a lot about mentorships. But you know, it takes There's the Mowgli organization and other organizations that are working in the Arab world where we're t teaching private sector people how to become mentors and match matching mentees and mentors. These are very simple things that we can do that we can get these youth into readiness and acceptance, either in creating companies that create jobs so that they become job creators rather than job seekers, or accepting the marketplace as it is. So we share what we have. Media. Nobody in the Arab world talks about entrepreneurs. I see Liz Dosset here. She doesn't talk about entrepreneurs on the BBC. But we need to tell these stories. These are the stories of our entrepreneurs. They're our heroes. It's not only the people that throw stones or carry guns or blow themselves up. There are plenty of people that are going out and struggling. We need to call that struggle a struggle for the freedom of the youth in the Arab world. It needs to be recognized. Entrepreneurship is a freedom and a human right. Once we recognize that, then 
We are doing something about it. Plenty of those. Nobody talks about them. Open any, any newspaper today. You will not see a single story about an entrepreneur and the feel good story. Why? We feel good about our countries. We live in them. And we want to encourage people that feel good about them. Our own journalists are socialist in their mentality and think private enterprise is terrible. <laughs> so there are platforms out there that are telling positive stories, like Wanda. I mean, I have, I'm sorry, I have to mention. But you go on Wanda and you see all sorts of stories that you had never heard of about entrepreneurs that are starting businesses and employing people. <laughs> so the solutions are out there. There is, we just need to go out and, and, and dig them out and, and the success stories need to be built on and we run with them. Mm. Let's hear your responses. I think I'd love to, to hear your responses to what you've heard and particularly any thoughts on how we move, how the region moves from still relatively small scale interventions to the larger scale and addressing the big issues. Please. Hi, my name is Shirihan. Um, I'm, I'm Palestinian Israeli. Um, and it's something that you don't hear of often because we're a small minority in Israel, Palestinian. We're Palestinian originally, but we're citizens of Israel. And through any, in any discussion, that I worked in Jordan for a year, so I, and I worked on youth unemployment issues in Jordan for a year. But the issue of the Palestinian minority in Israel is rarely brought up in any discussion about the Middle East and the Middle East youth and the Middle East unemployed. And it's a big problem because I, I, Palestinians in Israel are not only facing um, unemployment, but they're facing unemployment in a government that's totally and, and explicitly discriminating against these, these citizens. And I feel like we also face the same issues when we go to Arab countries. So for example, when I went to Jordan, I had a lot of problems finding a job because I was an Israeli citizen, um, even though I was Palestinian. So we can't find jobs in Israel because we're Palestinian, but we can't find jobs in the Arab, co in the Arab world because we're Israeli. Um, and this issue is, is, is rarely spoken about, and I would love to hear some feedback from, from the private sector in the Arab world about how to integrate the Palestinian citizens of Israel, because we belong to the Arab world, but our voices are rarely um, heard in any discussion on youth unemployment or the Arab world. I, I mean, I've, I've had friends similar to, to, uh, to Sharihan on this story. It's, it's, I, I'm telling you, there is, it's the, the ultimate guilt feeling of the Arab world is how to deal with you guys. We want to embrace you and we want to call for, for your liberation, but at the same time, we're not even accepting you except to go to Hajj. So, uh, uh, I mean, the, the only, and it took us years, you know, the, the, the Palestinians from, Muslim Palestinians from, from Israel were only allowed to go uh, in, in the late 80s uh, to be accepted in the region. That's, it's, a, it's a structural problem and, and our brain is not able to, to uh, wrap it around us to accept them that they are Israelis, yet they are Palestinians at the same time. That's the ultimate paradox. You know, maybe I can say something about it. this is not uh, to address your particular challenge, which is very acute, I realize, but there, there are many populations that have a lot of difficulty getting into the formal job sector or getting access to supports. What I see as a promising trend are some of the technology platforms that are being developed to con do, do sort of digital jobs across the web. So companies in the U.S. or in the Gulf or even within the region contracting out work, getting project-based work out to young women in Gaza, which is something we're working on, to others who may not be have an easy way into the formal economy, can get um, access to contract opportunity, project opportunities by um, applying technology skills um, and providing services, translation services online, web management, any number, graphic design, there are any number of jobs now that can be done remotely, online, virtually, and I think it's obviously very small. It's not the answer to, to your problem, but I wanted to call attention to a growing trend. I know there's an organization, Digital Divide Data, that's doing more of that, and certainly we're trying to make sure our platform integrates <laughs> some of these new technology jobs and provides greater access to greater diversity of populations, no matter where they are um, actually living or situated. I, I might add that there, is a, a, there are a couple of incubators, or one incubator in, in Nazareth, that is encouraging uh, Palestinian uh, Israelis, uh, Israeli Palestinians into, uh, into creating jobs. So there is, the, you need to find solutions within your own community if, if the rest of us are not accepting you at the end of the day. There are very successful uh, Arab Israeli entrepreneurs who have made it big time either through Intel or through the other multinational organizations that have been operating in Israel. They are already reaching out to, to people like you. And then maybe I can connect you with some of the guys that are doing that. 
And I would say two other positive signs. Uh, <clears throat> one of them is uh, with the help of the Skoll Foundation mainly, uh, the one laptop per child in Palestine has actually produced amazing results. Uh, today, <laughs> uh, uh, building on uh, the uh, online education, uh, 800 of the Khan Academy videos have been translated in Arabic by the Palestinian team in uh, Ramallah. Uh, and uh, today, if I want to hear Farid Al-Atrash and read the lyrics, uh, not Mireille Mathieu, I can, while two years ago I could not. And the second thing that's happening in Silicon Valley, which is astounding, is that the Israeli venture capitalists are getting together with people like us, the Arabs, to figure out how to best support the Palestinian entrepreneurs at the Jewish Community Center of Oshman in Mountain View. As Fadi was saying, and, 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 and Jamie and Sam and everyone, I think the, the, we've been discussing this issue for, for a long, long time in the Arab world. I happen to be a, a, a business leader from the Gulf, and as, as Fadi and Jamie know, I sit on the board of EFE, the global board. Um, and obviously, Fadi was echoing the point that the private sector has a role to play. But to be honest, unless we, we start shifting to having schools in the Arab world till to where becoming more private, the private sector today does not represent more than 10%, if probably in some countries even less, uh, of the total GDP. GDP investment in some of the economies of the Arab world don't represent uh, the, the most, probably 15 to 20% of total GDP. So how do we transform and make that paradigm shift? I mean, this is my third or fourth call uh, attendance. And uh, how do we make that paradigm shift? This disruptive approach is going to be a major task, I think. Uh, Fadi talked about uh, government mindset and public sector mindset. And I've been going to many of the WEF events, and I remember as far as 2005 or 6, World Economic Forum, the issue of Arab education reform has been on the agenda. And sadly, we haven't even seen traction. I mean, Jordan has made some initiatives in e-learning, but it, it kind of plummeted. Um, where do I see the challenge, to be honest? And that's where maybe we need to come with some pragmatic uh, ground-level solutions. I think a lot of the, with all the respect to consultants in the room, the, we've been over consultant, even in Saudi Arabia, where I come from, with ideas on how to bridge the education to employment gap, is really bring education to becoming an economic issue. And that's, that's how I would often frame it. At the end, education is about competitiveness. If we do not make that link, irrespective of what happens in education reform in the Arab world, we're not going to make it. It's like a pipeline. We are nurturing those youth to eventually find a job. And if we don't create that, we're always going to be failing. And I think the role of a business community in improving education outcomes is, is, the, is one of the answers uh, and, and should be the focal part. The biggest challenge is how do you convince public sector? I come with Fadi, I mean, I, I, I share with him some of, of his frustration. And, and the reality check is public sector individuals, nothing against them, they come from a different DNA. They've been nurtured. In, in a different totally. So a public-private partnership, the reason why things haven't happened, have failed. So how now do we take those schools, public schools, that are actually dominated by public sector, to now veer them to a private sector-led approach is, in my view, the, the, the challenge. EFE and the models we are trying to implement work, but we're talking about millions and millions and millions of youth and the tsunami that is facing us is even going to be worse uh, because we are not, uh, even in some countries in, 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 you know, in the Gulf, the economies are, are not as prosperous as they used to be in, in 2007 and 2008. Uh, Thank you. A very quick comment on the education side. I was born in a city and grew and finished a school in a country that ranked 27 in the world in 1965. We now rank 174. Uh, however, so that's Egypt, of course. However, um, when I look at the state of the art today in online education, as developed, for example, by a group in London of uh, Makat, the first two universities to adopt it, 14 disciplines of 400 references each, like 5,600 references curated uh, in content, the first two universities to adopt them are University College in London and the American University in Cairo. So. It's not Cairo University with 250,000 people, yeah. but there are 
incredible models that are following your hope of improving education. It seems that the challenge is somehow connecting everything, isn't it? The, a, a, regional, a regional approach and connecting institutions and connecting uh, the actors. Um, but can we now move to... Yes. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Geronimo. It's funny that you... Um, I'd, I'd like to challenge your, your view, actually, because you mentioned the word economic forum. I was invited there last year, too. And I went to plenty of forums where I was invited to talk about youth, blah, 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 blah. And it's always the same blame game that I hear. It's education that is the problem. And the funny thing is, most of the places, all the actors that are there, they're not from education, actually. They're not, I don't, I don't, I don't know, but they're not able to go and actually influence that. And um, it's the same, you're mentioning that issue in, in your area, but they're saying exactly the same for European youth. And uh, frankly, our education system isn't that bad, if we're really honest, if we compare, you know. But here, we're blaming the education system, too. We're saying there's a mismatch between the skills of our generation, etc and what companies really need. And then I hear that the problem to find a job is because um, this, you, you don't know how to write the CV or you don't know how to dress for, for um, an interview. And I wonder what's the matter with those companies if they have such an excellent personality and because of a lacking CV or because you don't know how to dress appropriately, they tell you you're not, you can't be hired. I think there might there might be a possibility, the mind shift of how we look at our generation and how we see that maybe we have, there might, might be more a gap of, 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 of values and attitudes where we come in with a different mentality that is no longer fitting the existing system of the kind of jobs that are there. And before, often, I, at least the impression that I had was businesses were willing to invest in these young people who came. They knew that they come off university, they're not gonna be ready for the job, but we we're gonna invest in them. Now we invented internships, so we can use them for free for a long time, you know, and then, you know, throw them away because new ones are coming, etc. And I wonder if there is not also a real role to be played by businesses in thinking about what's our responsibility in filling that gap when people come off university and then get them ready to do the job, creating the own human capital that we need in order to grow and investing in our own future. Thank you. Can I, can I comment on mm. that? Maybe it's a question of redefinition of what education is at the end of the day. So if, it is, if we are talking about education as sitting in a university and learning how to read and write and, and be intelligent and smart and get high grades because you memorize enough stuff, then, then, then this model is broken in the West and everywhere else. And you know, our education system is a product of what you have given us in, from the West. So we're, we're inheritors <laughs> of a system. So uh, uh, maybe we need to redefine it by defining it of who are the people and who are the stakeholders that get affected by it. And then these stakeholders come in and, 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 and address it from, uh, as, as Walid said, from, from, from learning uh, uh, and being, uh, being taught by professors uh, and teachers to becoming a much more practical sense and an economic sense. We learn to earn a living. We don't learn to, uh, uh, with all due respect to poets, and poets are great, uh, but poets are not going to create jobs. We need to learn to earn a living. I can tell you I work in marginalized areas in, in most of the countries of the Levant. We give scholarships for, for young students, four, five hundred of them every year. Then their biggest uh, challenge uh, uh, to Rehams, uh, the, the, their biggest challenge is that they're scared to death scared to death to go to an interview. They don't know what it means. It's like, you know, we studied, but, but we studied just because we had to study, because we needed to get that degree. They have no idea. The issue of learning how to write a CV is not, is learning how to do an interview and say, I am capable. I am capable of being employed. There's a big issue of that. So if we redefine it and understand that these kids, specifically from marginalized areas, the people that need most of these jobs, do not go to college just because they want to study. They go to college because they want to earn a living. And that's the gap of the revolution of aspirations. That is the failure of it. That's why we, we gave you uh, education, and the biggest failure of the aspiration is that education gave me nothing. I just wanted to say I, I completely agree the blaming, we've got to get over the blaming each other because everybody's got to change their mindset. I think the point that we're making about government is that they've got to change from trying to be directive on some of this stuff to try to be an enabler. Private sector's got to 
get in. They've got to create new pathways for young people to get in. They've got to start apprenticeship programs, mentoring programs internally to their companies so young people coming in are supported within the first year of their jobs. And we've got to make it easy for them. We've got to give them mentoring tools and protocols so that they can adopt them quickly when they make their first hire. And young people also, and I'd love Reham to comment at some point, have to also take a chance. You know, I, I meet a lot of young people in the region and elsewhere that basically have very unrealistic and high expectations about the first job and how much it's going to pay and, and they'll wait for that magic opportunity. And, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of people I know started very basically. I mean, I was a busboy. That was my first job. I mean, you have to start somewhere. So everybody, I think, in the system has to kind of make a little bit of a mental flip and change their perspective for the, for the whole system to change. We are blaming the governments, the businesses, the private sector, blah, blah, blah. But we're forgetting that students as well sometimes are to blame. I'm thinking about myself, and I was like, when I entered the university, I was expecting that all the knowledge in the world would be injected in my mind through the university. I, most, of the peop, most of the young people going to university, they think that university is the only thing, it's enough, because we, we created that bubble about education, that education will give you everything you need to know in life. So they are to blame because sometimes they're not looking for any complimentary. They think university is enough, the degree is enough. And we have the businesses who step in in the process only at two stages. The first one, from where I come from, uh, one year before graduation, you should go and train at one of the major companies, whether you choose or they choose you. And the problem with that training, it's a pass or fail course over the summer. And you go there, you head there, you don't exactly get the training you should be getting. You end up just making coffee and tea. And that's a big problem for many of the, of the graduates. And they should be actually experiencing how it feels like to be just working for a high company. I myself haven't experienced being just working uh, in, a, in a single in a company in a major company and see how the system works. I've never been to an official meeting to a board meeting before. I've never seen those systems that you just like upload a ticket or something. You get the last good one. I never experienced that, and that training should have provided me that. And you have the second stage where the businesses step in. It's like very late in the process where they have a vacancy that they need to be filled right away. And they put this ad, and with this famous line, you have to be at le you have to have at least one or two or three years of experience. We're fresh graduates. How on earth would be getting that experience? Where? Where are we going to be get getting this experience from? Mm -hmm. So all of issues. Wonderful. My name is Nader Al Khatib, and I'm the Palestinian director of uh, Friends of Earth Middle East. First comment about Sharihana. I think our culture really has victimized these people because the worst thing we are calling them, the Israeli Arabs. And we forgot that they are Palestinians. And we are just you know, promoting the use of you know, the Palestinian Israelis or the Palestinians of the Green Line. And it is really another, it's a big issue. Now coming the skills, the education, I think Fadi touched it. Everything is related to the, ed the education. And I deal on, ba on daily basis with teachers in schools, high schools, universities. And very clear, there is the lack of the ownership. The ownership is not there. And when a teacher you know, doesn't care what he's teaching, what happens in his class, that is a big problem. I, I studied nine years, the first nine years, in a refugee camp. And I remember those days, what it meant to be a teacher. But today, the worst job is a teacher. And in Palestine, we have created the worst university called the Open University. 70,000 students. Believe me, if I want to screen these 70,000, I will be lucky if I end with five good graduates. <coughs> the other universities, and I see also postgraduates, they submit thesis. And you can imagine, Nader is doing a master degree, and you know, he just goes to the internet, copies some things, and he doesn't read it. He doesn't even <coughs> review the acknowledgement. So instead of saying thanks to Monker, it is written thanks to Fadi. And he gets a degree. Education is not to get this paper. It's about the skills. And we talk about high unemployment. There are many opportunities 
And it is a nightmare when I want to hire a new staff. How to find him? And I've been really struggling now for two years to hire some people. I cannot find. There are many graduates. There are many graduates. Certificates, we have the highest number with you know, university graduates in the whole Arab world. But the skills. And we see you know, people who come, you know, of course there are some exceptionals. You know, somebody who wants to learn, he will do his best. But somebody who wants to get a degree and as a governmental employee, doesn't matter whether he goes, he wants at the end of the month a salary. Mm. That's his, you know, ambition. Thank so you. these Ministry of Education, they become like fossils. Mm. And if we want to improve, we have to start from there. Because science is the same. Whether it is Oxford, it is Open University. <laughs> Uh, my name is Julie Sullivan. I'm the provost at University of San Diego, and I'm moving as president to University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis this summer. Uh, and it is about the education, but it's a global issue. Uh, University of San Diego is a changemaker campus, part of the Ashoka Changemaker Campus Network. And this has been my passion. This is the passion I will take with me to University of St. Thomas. It is about skills and attitudes. And it is about teaching and giving young people experiences where they can develop these skills and attitudes of empathy, curiosity, risk-taking, initiative, comfort with ambiguity, all of these things. And, but it, and, and we just have to become better at doing this as educators, beginning in kindergarten, but certainly where I get them in higher education. And we have the same issue all over the world. It, mm -hmm. It's a global issue. And the, I'll say one other thing. Uh, the highest number of international students I have at both institutions are from the Middle East. And I have a school of entrepreneurship at the new institution where, I'm, where I'll be relocating as president. And I look forward to partnering with schools in the Middle East to develop change maker campuses around the world. Thank you. Partnering with the private sector. Yes. 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 And universities. Both. Yeah. I'm a collaborator. <laughs> My son went to USD, oh. and it's an awesome oh. university. And the next and one, he's surrounded Victoria. obviously by uh, people now, youth in uh, San Francisco, yes. uh, including those who are at Stanford University. And the university actually allows them to get out of the education system because the environment does not anymore require a university degree for you to be a legitimate aspiring entrepreneur. But exactly as has been said the skill set and those around you who believe in it. My name is Ali Gmishai, I'm from this business school, and we talked a lot about universities, and obviously we don't only do teaching, we also do research. And one thing I came across um, when I was asked to write a chapter on Islamic entrepreneurship and looked at the literature actually, the kind of the same problem Fadi mentioned is that the literature focuses on the state rather than on the business um, and the organizations. So I think one thing we should do as academics is focus on the, in the research side on businesses in entrepreneurship rather than um, the public sector. Oh, right. Really yeah. interesting. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Omar Koshiri. I, uh, I left Egypt a uh, year after the revolution to study in this actually school and sat here and exposed to two main ideas. One was that the business of business is business. Mm -hmm. And the second one was that social... Are they teaching you that now still? Yeah, give me a second. Give me a second. I'm sure there's some <laughs> from the admissions here. So one was the business of business is business. And the second was that social entrepreneurship has the capability of changing the whole world. Yeah. And I really liked uh, th the paper that you have sent out a, a couple of months earlier, talking about how um, companies can start thinking about their own interests in a way that's good for the world. And I think that one of the key problems uh, that's happening right now is there aren't enough companies that are thinking like that. And in order to have uh, an ability to change the system, you have to have a lot of unity between the key players. Um, in Egypt, for example, I'm, I'm working with Mercy Corps, we're starting the impact investing fund there. And one of the major problems entrepreneurs are facing is that in order to, for us to sign a term sheet with them, they have to go to Delaware to incorporate their companies there. And then we have to make the investment in US dollars. Because the term sheets cannot be used in uh, the, the legal, Egyptian legal system does not support them. So this is one example of the systemic problems that I think um, companies and people with like thought leaders should come together and think about to have like some actionable thing on the world, mm -hmm. like in, in the world. Well, the Middle East, Yanni, it's 2,000 years of uh, 
uh, wars, agony, ups and downs, and we're still optimistic, and we will always be optimistic. Yes. Uh, my name is Munqad Mahyar. I'm from Friends of the Earth uh, uh, Middle East. Well, um, my point here, what I would like to say, and Fadi, I need you to explain this to me, that uh, we feel that the private sector is trying to blame the education system and whatever happening in the, uh, in the Arab world or in, in Jordan in particular. But as far as I remember, when we started the privatization in Jordan, we, ha we were all hopes that the private sector will alleviate all this youth from their uh, problems. Uh, at a time that I remember I told a friend of mine that I'm afraid that the government will not find somebody to employ in the government because the private sector will take all the competent uh, uh, people or youth. Now, it's been over 10 years. And as we know, the private sector are well connected. And if they wanted to do change in the education system, 10 years is more than enough. So what happened? why the private sector, the privatization, over so, this period of time did not help until today. You need to differentiate totally, Munqad, between the privatization process and what the private sector is. They have nothing to do with each other. The private sector running old or owning old government companies that were given to the private sector in an auction or bought has nothing to do with the concept of the private sector. Don't confuse both. One is, is, is could be a, a, an investment bank that comes and owns an institution and sells it after two or three years. It has nothing to do with the employment process. You are looking at the wrong angle. The, in Jordan, my friend, 70% of our employees are in small and medium-sized industries. Did you know that? 70%. That's private sector. You don't need to be an employer of 5,000 people to be a private sector person. It is the small and medium-sized industries that actually employ. In the United States of America, every single new job that was created in the worst of times was because of startups and companies that are less than five years old. Less than five years old. The biggest problem in the Arab world is that in the banking system, and this is where, where you need to think about very carefully, the banking system only provides 8% of its loans to SMEs, 8%. Why? We are 50% of the GDP at least, and 70% uh, in, in general, so they don't take it. So very, depending on the country, 70% uh, SMEs are employers, while banks provide 8% of, the, uh, of, their, uh, of their loan portfolios. Explain that. It's very obvious because SMEs don't have, uh, cannot uh, collateralize. And then if your mother and father and everybody in the family does not sign and co-sign and guarantee you because you're not going to default on the HADA, register you're not going to and then register in Delaware for that matter. And then we're not going to trust you because <laughs> you don't give. But, but if you or I go to a bank and say, you know, my name is so and so, and they'll give you a million dollars. And obviously the failures in, in some of the banking systems in Saudi Arabia, for instance, was because of name lending name lending rather than giving the money to the SMEs. So if you, look, the solutions for many of the issues that we talk about in the Arab world are right in front of us. We don't necessarily need to do very much. What are they? Is we this don't need, huh? What are they? What are, I've, I've just addressed them to you. What are they? Availability of credit for, uh, for, uh, for SMEs. I'll give you an example. There are more than 3 million MFI recipients in the Arab world, microfinance recipients. Three million. Did you know that? Microfinance recipients are recipients of small loans that do not get collateralized. These are the unbankable human beings in the Arab world. What is the payback rate? 85% of them are women. What's the payback rate? 90, 97, 98%. So if we provide credit to the people that need credit, trust me, they will pay back. You know why? Because you want more. Because your reputation is so much more. I, I'm saying that these are, these are part of the solution. How do we address the education issue? Involve structurally and institutionally the people that employ in the, in the process of, of, uh, of the education system. For the private sector to have its own uh, training systems. Yes, the private sector needs. It's not only me receiving. I have to, if it's in my own interest, to, to, uh, to find these solutions. So 
Yes, these are issues that are right there. Can we change the education system? This is the question. (laughs) I'm watching the clock. I'm sorry, I'm going to step in here. I'd like to offer each of the panellists a chance, really, to say what's their ask to this room, which is a room full of people who can make things happen and and get things done. (coughs) Um, Fadi, you've outlined something already. May I ask then Jamie and the others, and perhaps you might like to to wrap. Yeah, what I want to say is I I share the orientation of, of Fadi and many here that that the solutions are there. There's no big new idea that has to be invented. We actually need to take the solutions, accelerate the change. And we've got to do it by bringing all the different sectors together. We've got to do it in in, uh, partnerships. We've got to be flexible in our thinking. We can't just be implementing one model. Um, We've got to be thinking very flexibly about all the different solutions that we know work. And also being very open to bring models from outside the region that have worked at scale. And we've got there's a great report that I rely on to look at those system change um, examples that uh, McKinsey just put out a couple of months about, ago, education to employment. And there's some excellent examples in other countries where industries have gotten together and been able to provide jobs for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of young people in India and other places. And so we've got to take all that great um, knowledge and really come together and accelerate. And I guess that what I wanted to, my ask to this room is to, um, not give up on the Middle East and North Africa. You can tell from Riham and everybody's enthusiasm and optimism that there's huge talent and potential in the region. It's just being tapped at a very small level and there's just enormous potential for growth. And this young population, as everybody says, it, it could be a lost generation, but more likely it's going to be the dividend that's going to keep on paying for decades to come. And, you know, if they can relax uh, migration borders and, and really provide better trade agreements across um, the region, there'll just be a a huge um, potential for regional economic growth as well. So anyway, that's, I I always like to, in these kinds of conversations, make sure people don't leave so frustrated with the the crisis or the challenge um, because there's so much huge potential and so much already going on, as Osama was so um, eloquent about. There's already a lot of activity, even the last couple of years, that's just continuing to build momentum and we've got to get behind that and accelerate it. I have a few suggestions myself. Um, I'm going to tap in the educational system a little bit more. Um, looking at the teachers, with all the respect to all the teachers in all the educational system in around the globe, I think there should be more innovators among these teachers, like somebody like Fadi Ghandour or, or somebody who has like a major success story in his life. I think being taught in a course, a story, just a life story about a person <laughs> like him or other success stories or other startups, would be a te- would be like an amazing chance for me to learn, and I think a person like that is a teacher that's gonna be hard for me to forget and not be inspired of. And I do think that sometimes I'm gonna tap in uh, as a students as from their early stages in the universities. A lot of students are incapable of just paying their debts for the universities, so they just pull out after one or two years because they can't pay the debts they have for the university. I. I'm thinking, why can't universities just start having this, like, courses on the margin that make people or make these students who are financially incapable of paying their debts just paying their debts by, like, learning specific books or learning, tapping on some knowledge. Like, these courses are specifically made for these students to take, and instead by instead of just paying uh, money for the university, we can pay the university back by knowledge, by having more knowledge in ourselves as students. Um, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of MBAs, like programs around the world in Oxford and other universities. I think there should be a program that's an MBA only for entrepreneurs, where I can actually walk in depth through all the success stories around the world and walk through that journey with them. And my last suggestion would be that um, I would love as an entrepreneur in my early stages of a startup to just get into a program that's provided by some party out there that can get me to travel to see like a global startup that's been a massive success story and work for them for a month, two or three, just to see how how they work, how they made it through and learn from them and get back home and take all the things I learned from there to just plant it in my own startup and avoid a lot of mistakes that I could have made during that startup journey 
if I hadn't been there. So. I have actually a hope uh, and an initiative uh, that I think may, uh, may help. Uh, as uh, the people filled with anxiety, the tens of millions uh, in, uh, at least in my country, the desperates looked at the divine for salvation. That path was filled by mullahs, murshids, and ayatollahs. And I'm hoping that somehow that link is broken, uh, that the hope comes from real initiatives, if you will, uh, rather than, uh, if I may say, the Muslim brothers. On the initiatives, um, seven out of, the co uh, of 10 companies that are financed in uh, Silicon Valley are from outside of Silicon Valley that came to be financed. And four out of every 10 uh, new company are Indians. The Indian community is a large community in the diaspora, and our community in the diaspora is about 5 million. And I think that the role that we can play in economic development, in cultural transformation, including a simple example, which is actually, and I'm sorry that Sally is not here. Uh, if you go to guru.org, G-O-O-R-U.org, this was actually started by an Indian who led Google in India. And when he came back to Palo Alto, he started an online education system that takes search, content, and community curation and provides the most astonishing set of tools for education, for online education that anyone can use, by the way. Anyone can use. And the Arabization actually happened because of the Palestinians, because of the uh, one laptop per child. So I'd say on the education side, it's a relatively simple problem to solve, in my opinion, from a content perspective. From a cultural perspective of what you do with it, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what your parents tell you at school and whether they treat you as a hero or as a garbage collector. Mm. The diaspora's engagement, and that's exactly what we are committed to do, uh, to be able to engage mind and heart and help shape the contours of the policy and share both the richness of their experience and the riches to help their country, as has happened with the Global Irish, as has happened with OPEN, the Organization of Pakistani Entrepreneurs, as has happened with Thai, the Indus Entrepreneurs, is very likely to be transformative. Mm -hmm. And I hope that any one of you who's here, who has the passion for it, will join. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. A few more comments? Uh, at the back, Princess Badri, thank you. Bendri Al Faisal, I'm managing the King Khalid Foundation in Saudi Arabia. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, I have a few things, and I w wouldn't comment on the whole MENA region. I'll, I'll comment on Saudi Arabia and the Gulf because that's what I'm familiar with. Um, I think one of the issues that we have is, as, as, as you mentioned, is the youth themselves. So we had uh, in the foundation um, an initiative where we actually went and asked them what their issues were, and they're the same ones that Fadi came up with, employment, education, and inclusion. And we, we put about 200 youth together with key decision makers that they selected, so Minister of Education, Minister of Labor, and the head of the National Dialogue, and uh, uh, Walid was also there, and um, they were very quick to be to comment and to be critical and to to voice their opinions, but then when they were given the opportunity, please come to the ministry, come to this place, and come and share your thoughts with us and actually take action, they never followed through, despite us following up and trying to get them and try, you know facilitating the whole thing. It was it was very disappointing that that they didn't have the initiative to actually do something rather than complain. Um, and then the other thing is, um, that's sort of the negative, and then the positive, I, I graduated from King Saud University, my undergraduate, 18 years ago. And I was just recently asked to come and speak there about sort of what I've been doing in my, and, and I have to say, when I was there, I was ignorant for four years. I learned nothing that was of value. And I, I felt that I didn't know how to communicate or how to do anything. And the young ladies that I saw there were completely different. They were interested, they were uh, vocal, they were participating, they were asking me very tough questions. And I think it, things have changed drastically. I was, I was inspired when I saw them. And I think it's to do with both a change in the education system, but more importantly is, is the technologies there. They don't need to just rely on, on what they're given in books and in classes. And they are taking advantage of these things. So that was just some comments. Thank you. David Haskell of Dreams Indeed. Um, 
having lived and worked in the Middle East for 31 years now in the private sector, in education, and now in social entrepreneurship. Uh, I thought I would just mention one case that uh, would resonate with a number of these comments and that highlights, I think, a missing piece of the puzzle because it's a very complicated puzzle. And that piece is values. And that's been mentioned several times, but I just wanted to amplify that a bit. Uh, the case I wanted to mention is in a social enterprise called Care With Love in Egypt that we collaborated with. Um, it's a remarkable case where uh, a medical doctor, Megda Iskander, looked at two different populations. As a medical doctor, she was working in a hospital and, and noticed many patients did not check out after their treatment was finished, which she thought was kind of odd. And so she looked under the, uh, under the story and discovered there's no home health care and hospice training in the country of Egypt. Hmm. And on the other hand, she looked at the youth population of unemployment, and she says, it's kind of obvious. These people need these people, and these people need these people. So she put them together and provided uh, skills and values training, not just skills, to um, over about a 12-year period, about 1,000 jobs created of the unemployables, okay? 85% women. Uh, over 80% 80, 80 uh, without a high school education. So we're not talking about the unemployed graduates, we're talking about the unemployed non-graduates. And uh, about 47% in that 18 to 24 year old range. Okay, so these are the people that are not even yet in the discussion. Remarkable job creation. At the same time, taking care of 1,500 clients who never had a chance to be get cared for. Uh, that's the great part of the story. And personal friends with her, we watched it for 10 years, applauded. She, uh, she's an award winner. She's an Ashoka, an Acumen Fellow, and all the rest, which was fantastic. After 10 years, she was about ready to grow and franchise and scale. And the first franchise got lackluster results. So we call up. She calls us up, we get together, and over dinner in Cairo, we together try to figure out why. And together we diagnosed. The skills training transferred. It's not an issue of skills. Skills are easily taught within a period of six weeks, eight weeks, three months. People pick up skills. What didn't transfer was the values. And therefore, the potential for scale tapers off. Yeah. Interesting. So what do you, how do you train values? Okay, This was the issue of its skills and attitudes, not just skills. So together, over about a year's process, we teamed up with her and some remarkable educators, Egyptian bottom up, where they put together a curriculum for the training or the, the encouragement of the practice of the core values that were defined bottom up with all of her stakeholders on the inside of her organization. What were the core values? Well, things like compassion, integrity, commitment, honesty. I mean, you're, you're hiring somebody to come in and take care of your grandmother inside the home. Can you trust this person? It's an issue of values. It's not an issue of just competence. Well, that was designed into a training curriculum. The curriculum is rolled out. And over a period of about 18 months, we come in and do the pre-post. Did it really make a difference? Statistically significant, a jump in performance by all of their caregivers, but especially the ones that were rated excellent. If the values are made explicit and clear, and the content of the curriculum completely Egyptian, nothing imported from the outside, no need to tap outside models, it's on the inside of the region. They went to Egyptian sources, holy scriptures, the folklore of their own organization, folklore of Egyptian culture. They identified the best of Egyptian culture and insisted 
on a participatory process to assimilate those values, practice those values, and guess what? Performance jumps. So as an employer in the region who's been in multiple startups, the real issue is not just the skills. The real issue is, did I get somebody that's honest, that's gonna be committed, that's gonna go the distance, okay? And I, I've uh, studied the case uh, that Dima Jamali at the American University of Beirut wrote up on Aramex. And right in the heart of Fadi's ideology is what? Some values, okay? So I think one of the missing pieces in the conversation, or a piece that's been mentioned in tangent, but I think actually needs to be put front and center at the heart of the whole thing. In addition to the structural changes is the issue of can we find the best of the values that have made Arab culture great for millennia and get those front and center practiced such that employers can encourage them, educators can advocate them. And those are found right there in the region. They don't need to be imported from Stanford and Oxford and Berkeley and whatnot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I just want to add a quick point, which is I think Thomas Jefferson said that even when politicians do the right thing, they do it for the wrong reason. And I think one thing that has not been mentioned here during the discussion is we speak, for example, about bad education to as in bringing those who are badly educated into the public sector. But there's an incentive behind that, which is maintaining the loyalty of the population to the regimes in question. It's not done because they're ignorant. You, we can go speak to all ministers of education, but if they don't understand that there's an incentive that we can inflict a cost on them, if they don't improve the education system, then nothing will change. The reason Israel, for example, destroys Palestinian solar panels isn't because Israel doesn't understand why alternative energy is beneficial, why entrepreneurial skills are beneficial. It's because Israel has an incentive to prevent Palestinian energy uh, independence and so forth with many of the examples that we mentioned. So the challenge here, I think, if we truly want to achieve change, if we want to be disruptive, is to figure out how we can inflict costs on extractive governments that do not reform. And that's something that, and here I can speak both as an activist and as an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, it becomes very scary to attempt to challenge governments because they can shut you down. They can kick you out of the country. They can imprison you. Even speaking right now, I understand, for example, starting our company, which is an alternative energy company in Palestine. One of the things we had to do was get a contract from the government to begin producing energy. One of the challenges we had is although we came to them with a price that's cheaper than the price that they have to pay Israel to get electricity, we came with them for a financial plan that would bring them millions of dollars, and we provided them with the necessary skills and did half of the work for them. For reasons of corruption, they didn't want to accept that, so we had to map out the different fightings within the different factions within the political system. We needed to understand how to inflict costs upon them in the media. We need to know which private actors to bring in that could put pressure on them, and I think that specifically in the Middle East, that's something that needs to be taught, because we can keep speaking from the positive section, and it's important to talk about values, it's important to talk about planning, strategy, social entrepreneurship, but it's also important to talk about strategic thinking and understanding when to use carrots and when to use sticks. And that's something I felt that was missing and wanted to bring up here. Thank you very much. The issue of uh, economic empowerment uh, of the individual is a political issue uh, at its core because it is basically saying, exactly like you said, and thank you very much for bringing that, but it's basically saying that the individual can create independent wealth of the state. And by definition, that is, that is at the core of the, of, of the failure of, of, the, of the system. It's at its core. And that's why if you said uh, 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 that the youth will extract a cost, and that, that's what's happening today. The youth are extracting a cost because they do want to even if they don't have independent wealth today, they are saying, we, we, are, we want to be counted. Mm. My name is Sushant Zanyanapur. I manage the Skoll Center. Um, but I'm an Iranian, uh, Iranian-Canadian, and uh, was involved in the Iranian summer before the Arab Spring. Um, mm. My question, I, I think he took the words out of my mouth almost with a beautiful narrative. It's really about political innovation, though. Uh, you know, if the future of education in the region is uh, job readiness and jobs, you know, vocational training almost, who will lead political innovation? 
that's the bigger elephant in the room. The, the more near-term elephant right now is the, is the joblessness generation that spans across the entire region and the world. But it's the failure of the institutions and the failure of a number of structural issues in those institutions that do not motivate the, the likes of my cousins and others inside the region to want to demand change or to, to want to create value in different ways. So uh, to, to challenge uh, sort of your, uh, your assumption on the, the youth didn't stand up to, to uh, engage us uh, you know, in, in ways that we thought were meaningful, I think the, the mandate you might have provided them was not disruptive enough for them to really you know, bring out what was inside of them, to demand the kind of changes that are necessary for them to own their countries. Look at the demographic pyramids. We are going to inherit all of these problems in the next 15 years. You have inherited them already. Uh, yes, we I am. own them. And uh, what, what world will my children live in, in the, if I want to go back to this region? These, uh, we have to think about political innovation, using entrepreneurship as the route to, to this, not just for training skills and whatnot, but how do we disrupt institutions? Mm -hmm. And if you have reflections, I think you, I mean, your generation is the people that but guide us in that sense. The, the, the economic yeah. independence, yeah. by definition, means political yeah. capability of expression, independent of where your wealth is happening. So if you create your wealth independently of the state, then you are able to be stand up and be counted. When you are dependent on the state, then there is a whole, you know, I, that, that's a long discussion about mm. this. Hi, my name's Lucas Welch. I'm the founder of an organization called Solia. And I, I want to just begin with an observation. I think it's refreshing to see everyone taking responsibility in their particular sector. I think it's, Fadi, it's wonderful to hear you standing up and talking about what the private sector should be doing. We had uh, Riham talking about what a student should be doing and the, the provost talking about what needs to happen in education. And so I, I, I'm a social entrepreneur who's been working in this space for about 10 years. And I, I'd like to give a critical reflection on, I think, what is a common temptation we face as social entrepreneurs is that I think we often get attracted to the sort of new paradigm shifting ideas, which whether that means some innovative use of maybe it's a new iPad app or it's a new technology. And I think it's important that we accept, particularly if we're going to look at a really scalable solution to address this, that the constraints we're seeing in the public sector, the constraints we see particularly in public education, they're part of the challenge. We need to, we need to draw our innovation and have our innovation fit into that challenge. And so, you know, we do, a, we do a program we call virtual exchange, which is curriculum embedded, technology enabled, cross-cultural education. And yes, it was a lot easier for us to build our partnership with the American University in Cairo. Um, it was much easier to build a partnership with the American University in Beirut. But after 10 years of doing this work, we now have a waiting list of over 1,000 students at Minufia University. Minufia University is a public university in the Nile River Delta region of Egypt. And so it, it took a lot of tea, it took a lot of time sitting down and building trust, but ultimately it's possible. And so I think it's important that we embrace those challenges and that it's also important that the private sector, the government sector, shines a light on the models that are working and, and that we really try and amplify those. So Thank you. Thank you. How many have read uh, Bernard Lewis, uh, What Went Wrong? Mm -hmm. So in it, he actually, it's a, Maybe the world is not that black and white, but effectively he says, in the West, you make money to ascend to power. In the Middle East, you ascend to power to grab the money. <laughs> so while they're both unethical, but the economic impact is exactly the opposite. I want to add um, something quite short, and I'm very happy that Fadi and um, Sushant spoke um, before me and said, um, that would add to that, I guess. I'm a member of the Israeli parliament, and I'm 27 years old, which means that until two months when I became a parliament member, I was in the same job market in Israel, um, moving from one job to another without having any security um, in my work, in my salary. I was a journalist and a social activist, so you can imagine what that means um, in terms of having a job at all. And the situation in Israel and the Jewish um, part in Israel is, is very similar to, to, the re to what we're talking about in, in, the, in the general context of the Middle East. But I think that one thing that we're missing, and I'm missing in this conversation, it's like we gave up on our government. And, and what you just said um, was exactly, what meant exactly this. Young people in the Middle East have no political power. 
They don't have political power. They don't have it in Israel, and they don't have it in the rest of the Middle East. They don't have it because they gave up on their governments, because they saw so much corruption, so many interests, so much... Uh, there's just no, there are no words to describe what we saw in our governments and in all the different protest movements. And I came to my position in parliament because I was one of the organizers for a protest movement on social justice in Israel. But what we did, and, and, and what I don't see happening enough, and, and we're just in the very basic stages of that, is to take that energy that came from the streets, from people who wanted change, from a young generation, and yes, it's a generational thing, definitely. A young generation, they want to see a different Middle East. They want to see a different connection and relationship between citizens and their countries, between citizens in different countries and neighboring countries. But that young generation is still staying, in most cases, distant from political positions, from political power. And if there's something that we need to look at that I think would make a huge difference um, to that aspect, to our education, to, to our job market, to everything else, and to, you know, being living, um, most of us probably, most of the people in the room are living in, um, in a conflict zone or a semi-conflict zone. If we want to see a change like that happening, we have to support young people to get into politics to get into political positions, to not be afraid of that, to not think that it, don't, that, it, that it's not belong to us, that we're not belong there. I think this is the most important thing. If we want to see a change coming in the next few years, it's not about having the private sector dealing with all the different problems and um, making a favor, really, and allowing young people to enter and have a proper job. It's about us getting the power for ourselves and changing the world that we're living in. And I think that if there's any way to support that, support young people in training, in not being, really in removing fears of political power um, and allowing them to enter that world. I think that's our, our greatest mission. Can we have one more and then we'll wind up? Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. I think if we can just have one more point here from Noura and then we'll, uh, I'm afraid we will have to, uh, we will have to yeah, wrap up. I want to comment on what Fadi was saying also about uh, um, uh, if we will focus on solutions and what are the solutions that will give us uh, the biggest impact. And this is something I've faced and uh, Dr. Osama knows in, in Qatar. Um, you know, I came from a private sector and I worked in the government to change, to help changing, you know, what's, uh, how we can really empower youth and uh, give them a hope. So uh, the main, main challenge that I faced is about how we can really maximize funding. And funding was uh, through uh, a debt guarantee program that we have designed for the government. And when I designed that program, I looked in the whole region and there is no government guaranteeing the risk of startups or SMEs to the private sector. So the banks always will ask for the guarantees. Where in, the, in, the, in America or in the uh, developed countries, there are guarantees that are given for the, for the banks to secure jobs. So if we will manage to solve this problem in the Middle East, then by default, education will change, things, other things will change. If we will not uh, solve the, 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 the guarantee, so access to, the, to money will, will encourage private investors to invest in something that the, the bank will, will invest in. So today, all the programs in the Middle East, uh, I'll talk about the, the Gulf region, is managed by government, by people have, who have no clue about what is business, and how business really can be funded. So you go to get the, a loan and they will give you a loan and put your life on the edge and at the end of the day you will not be really successful. So I think if we will focus on debt guarantees program that will cost government nothing, uh, it will really solve the problem. I think we'll have to leave it there. It's been an enormously rich discussion. I want to thank our panelists, Osama, Riham, Jamie, Fadi. Thank you so much.